Welcome to the Eastside Freedom Library. Thanks for coming in on a summer Friday night. Um, I'm Peter, um, one of the founding co-directors here at the Eastside Freedom Library. A um, couple of basic housekeeping things. Uh, we have a guest book. We're very eager to get people to sign the guest book. And we promise that we'll send you only one email a month. We put out a monthly newsletter of upcoming events and activities. So please do uh, sign the guest book. Uh, restrooms are downstairs. Uh, and I want to call your attention to the mural in the stairwell on the way downstairs. Um, that was painted by Jerry Yang, a local Hmong artist, uh, based on discussions with about eight different community groups here on the east side, beginning with Dakota people and most recently Karen. Um, so do take a look at the mural. Um, if you haven't been here before, I just want to explain that um, this historically was uh, a St. Paul Public Library. Uh, this is a Carnegie uh, Library building. Um, it was paid for uh, by the sweat and blood and labor of immigrant iron miners, uh, steel workers, coal miners, who made Andrew Carnegie uh, the richest man in America. Um, so we should always recognize those workers that really paid for this building. Um, and appropriately, we are focused on the stories of uh, immigrants and workers and the labor movement, movements for social justice. Uh, and so we have assembled this collection uh, now at about 1,000 books, uh, all donated and all cataloged by volunteers. Um, we've shelved the books by the collections as they were donated. Some of you probably um, knew High Berman, High's books are here. Uh, Paul Rabinowitz, Naomi Sheeman, Fred Ho, the jazz musician. Um, we really have outstanding books here. We also are in a partnership with the Hmong Archives, the most important archive anywhere in the world of uh, Hmong diasporic experiences. Their books are in probably eight or nine different languages. And we, we have about a thousand pandao, story cloths, musical instruments, other material objects documenting the Hmong experience. Our major goal here is to be a place where people come to share their stories uh, with each other. I always like to say to audiences that um, if there are things that you would like to make happen or, or would like to see happen here, please um, talk with me. Um, Clarence, would you stand up? My colleague Clarence White, you can always talk to Clarence. Um, my partner Beth Cleary all the way in the all the way in the back. Um, you can talk to Beth. Um, there's a lot coming up uh, in the next couple weeks. We have four different musical events, including a, a South, South African choir of young people from the townships outside of Cape Town um, who will be here talking about their experiences and singing. So pick up flyers on the desk of upcoming activities. Um, I was thrilled when my neighbor and friend Brad Griffith uh, pestered me about uh, wouldn't you like to host Medea Benjamin? And, uh, and, and of course I said hell yes, but, um, but if this would not be happening tonight if Brad had not had the idea uh, that this is an event that, that should happen here. And so I, I hope that many of you have ideas. Um, I've known about Medea and her work for a very long time, and uh, I greatly respect that not only what she has stood for, but that she has stood for what she stands for. Um, all over the world, from Gaza to Iran to Iraq uh, to Washington, D.C. to San Francisco to all over the place. Um, before Medea uh, comes up and, and educates us about uh, Iran. I want to introduce a very dear friend, Sarah Jane Olson. Um, we are always looking here at the Eastside Freedom Library to partner with other organizations. Um, we think it's a great way to get mixes of people to come together. And so uh, when Brad got us connected with Medea and Code Pink, 
Um, then we reached out to Women Against Military Madness and they were very quick to say that they would love to co-sponsor the event. So Sarah Jane's gonna say a little bit about Women Against Military Madness and then Medea will come up and share knowledge with us. So, Sarah Jane. Women Against Military Madness, or WAM, is pleased to co-sponsor tonight's speaker, Medea Benjamin. Now, in our 36th year, WAM has organized and educated our community about American military aggression and nuclear proliferation. Initiating committees that work to highlight the American penchant for war, drone warfare, U.S and economic machinations in the Middle East, peace issues, and the increase of American involvement in torture as policy with the Iraq invasion in 2003. We hold weekly peace vigils, both of which have been in effect for years, on Wednesdays, 5 to 6 p.m. at the Lake Street Marshall Avenue Bridge and a Palestinian peace vigil on Fridays from 4.30 to 5.30 p.m. at the intersection of Summit and Snelling Avenues in St. Paul. Our anti-torture committee is currently developing a website dedicated to humanizing people who are othered by our media with a particular focus on creating short videos and messages linking ordinary Iranians and Americans in order to recognize and celebrate each other as potential friends and cooperators. We think accurate information and getting to know each other lessens unfounded fear of people. Tonight, Miss Benjamin will help us understand the history of U.S. involvement in Iran that dates back decades and help us understand how we, as average Americans, can work to prevent our government and military from embroiling us in another war that brings no relief from our domestic problems but in fact exacerbates them and leads to death and destruction in a country whose affairs are not deleterious to those of the United States. WAM is proud, in tandem with the Eastside Freedom Library, to present a co-founder of Code Print, Medea Benjamin. Sarah gave my talk and we should go into Q&A. And it's wonderful that WAM is already doing what we want to do more of, which is that kind of uh, cultural exchanges to humanize Iranians uh, in a time when uh, Donald Trump is really trying to present people from the Islamic world, whether they're Shia or Sunni, he obviously does not distinguish, probably doesn't know the difference, um, but making them all seem as if they are potential terrorists. And uh, I do want to thank Brad and Peter and Sarah, well, Sarah and Beth and Clarence um, for the invitation to be here and what a beautiful space this is and really gives a sense of what we can do when we are creative and we love books and art and culture and it is just extraordinary to be here. So thank you so much for the invitation and for the venue. And before I talk about Iran, I thought maybe we should, I should just muse a little bit on um, the NATO gathering and Donald Trump and how absolutely horrendous it is that he goes to our 
allies in Europe and chastises them constantly that they are not spending enough money on weapons. And you know, this has nothing to do with NATO dues. They're all paying their NATO dues. This is a separate thing, right? This is that he wants them to buy more US weapons. That's what it's about. And Donald Trump has really been the most incredible salesperson for US weapons. Of course, Barack Obama wasn't too bad himself. <laughs> and all US presidents have been pretty good at it. Uh, but Donald Trump really, this is something he does excel in. And on the positive side, it's wonderful to see Europeans, the people especially, pushing back against that and saying we don't want to spend more money on weapons. We actually, most of them have and want to improve their healthcare system, their free education system, their good transportation system, the commitments they have made through the Paris Accords to work on the issue of catastrophic climate change. So I think it is very inspiring, particularly today, to see the massive turnout in the streets of London. Hundreds of thousands of people who came out. That blimp is just fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> that picture of baby Donald Trump with what we might call diapers, they call nappy. I love the nappy. <laughs> they even got the safety pin on it. So cute. And that the mayor said, well, yes, this is free speech. This should be flying uh, in the skies in London. And now Donald Trump really had to skirt around the city so that he wouldn't be uh, in the middle of protests. And um, I think it was just a great example and a real inspiration about how people can get out and show their disgust at a president who has been in charge of a policy that has been snatching children away from their parents, that has been against immigration, whether it's to the United States or to Europe, telling them about it's changing their culture, meaning they're becoming less and less white. Uh, and they're speaking out against um, misogyny, they're speaking out against Donald Trump's priorities and values. And um, so it's, you know, while we are, are probably, uh, most of us in this room, if not all of us, very ashamed of Donald Trump's behavior, on the other hand, at least it's clear who he is, and it gives our friends overseas a chance to say who they are. And on that, um, and uh, to inspire us to do more to oppose his policies. On the other hand, there are some things that Donald Trump has been involved in that are actually good. I would say meeting with Putin is a good thing. And as much as we don't want anybody interfering in our elections, you know what? The US should stop interfering in the elections of people all over the world, as we have done for many, many decades. But I think it's a good thing that Donald Trump meets with Putin. I think that's what leaders should do. And I think it was a very good thing that Donald Trump met with Kim Jong-un in North Korea. And you know, the uh, anti-Trump folks in the media and in the Democratic Party are always trying to portray everything that Donald Trump does as negative. And I think we can be more nuanced in the way we look at this. And when Donald Trump is doing something good that might actually help to alleviate the conflict in the Korean Peninsula, uh, we should applaud that. And I know we have, where's Steve? Ah, here, who has worked for so long on issues of Korea, and we were, and Martha. We were together um, recently in, in May when we, I was with a group called Women Cross the DMZ. We had been there in 2015, and uh, they, you have a great um, uh, quarterly that has a um, wonderful 
article on the women cross the DMZ. Um, that was in 2015. We went back again in May. And this time we were not allowed to go to North Korea, not because the North Koreans wouldn't let us in. It was because Donald Trump has now made it illegal to go to North Korea. So on the one hand, while he is reaching out uh, to the leaders, he is trying to stop more of the people-to-people -people ties. It is the only place in the world now where it's illegal for Americans to travel. I mean, we can even travel to Cuba with some restrictions, but in the case of North Korea, it's the only place. So we were not allowed to go to North Korea this time. We went to South Korea and we walked to the DMV, the misnamed Demilitarized Zone, because it's the most militarized zone in the world. And uh, everywhere that we went, we were told a similar thing by the Koreans in the South that we met with, which is people in the North, they live in a very authoritative government. They don't have the ability to have a civil society that can actively push for things like peace. But in the South, they now do. And they have a very, very vibrant civil society. In fact, it's so vibrant that underreported in the United States is the fact that they had this candlelight vigil that started out in November of 2016, where people started coming out on the streets in the evening with candles, totally nonviolently, against the government in power because the President Park was corrupt. And so they went out and they went out and they went out and more and more people started coming out to the streets and lo and behold by March of 2017 one out of every three people in South Korea had been out on the streets in those candlelight vigils. So of a population of about 50 million it's over 15 million people that were out in the streets. And they were asking their legislature to impeach a corrupt president. How's that sound? <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. And in fact, the South Koreans were able to do that. And they impeached the president. They had new elections and what is called the candlelight uprising that led to the uh, election of President Moon on a mandate to get rid of corruption, but also to start a process for making peace with the North. And so he is carrying out the people's mandate. And while we were there the last time was when Donald Trump all of a sudden decided that he wasn't going to do the summit. Remember, there was like a, a little period of time in there. And so we quickly went and met with people in the U.S. Embassy in Seoul and uh, folks in, in the movement in South Korea got out on the street and started another candlelight vigil to say we really want this summit to happen. And lo and behold, the next day, the president of the South met with the chairman of the North and figured out how they were going to get things on track. And what the Koreans were saying basically is that the peace train has left the station. And we don't have faith in Donald Trump. He is the most erratic leader we have seen. But we have faith in this peace process, and it's going forward with or without him. So that is something extremely positive that is happening. But it is quite ironic that Donald Trump is meeting with and starting a peace initiative with the leader of one of the most authoritarian countries in the world. And meanwhile, he is taking us down the war path with the leaders of Iran, a country by comparison is much more democratic. It's also quite ironic and tragic, I would say, that Donald Trump is so close to the Saudi regime I have a, another book that I did on Saudi Arabia uh, that's back there along with the Iran book because I thought it was so important that we educate ourselves about the horrific effect of the U.S. close relationship with Saudi Arabia and that we understand more just how incredibly repressive the Saudi regime is internally to anybody who might dare to dissent as well as it is externally with exporting its 
perversion of Islam called Wahhabism, the most intolerant version that forms the ideological basis of groups from ISIS to Al-Qaeda, and is also now the number one weapons purchaser of not only US weapons, but all of our Western great democracies from Canada to England to France to even Sweden. Sweden, where the foreign minister has a fantastic program for a feminist foreign policy, but can't stop the weapons sales from the Swedish weapons companies to Saudi Arabia. So here, and, and what are the weapons being used for? to destroy neighboring Yemen and create the worst human catastrophe in the world right now. So that are, those are our allies, the Saudis. And in the meantime, the US, uh, now particularly with Donald Trump, is on this war path with Iran. And that's why I wrote the book very quickly on Iran. It's a basic primer, kind of a 101. Because there is a saying that war is the way that Americans learn geography. You heard that? <laughs> and I really wanted to help turn that around so that we learn geography in order to prevent war. And I don't do a, um, I do a real disservice to Iran in the first chapter describing the over 2,500 year history of Iran because it is quite an extraordinary country with a beautiful history, and go quickly into the more modern times because that's so important for us to learn to understand where we are today. And so when you look at the 1900s when the Shah was in power, uh, you see that this was a pro-Western regime and a very repressive one. And the West was so enamored of the Shah because the Shah allowed the Western companies to do business with Iran on a very favorable basis to those corporations. And the most important resource of, of Iran, oil, was given to a British company uh, called the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company, today BP. And uh, the Iranians we're saying, why is it that our oil is used to enrich the British instead of enriching us, the Iranians? And so in a very nonviolent way, what did they do? They elected a prime minister in 1951, Mohammed Mossadegh, on a platform to nationalize Iran's oil. And this was something seen as the British as horrible, not only because of taking away the money that the uh, British oil company was earning, but also the example that it would set for other oil-rich countries, be it neighboring uh, Iraq or across the oceans in a place like Venezuela. And so the British worked hard to convince the US government that this could not stand. And the CIA got involved, and the 1953 coup was an example of a covert operation that, quote, successfully overthrew a democratically elected government. In fact, it was considered so successful that the same model was used the next year in 1954 in Guatemala to overthrow the government of Jacobo Arbenz. It was used in 1960 in uh, the uh, Congo to overthrow the government of Patrice Lumumba. It was tried in Cuba the following year in 1961 with the Bay of Pigs. Uh, and it was considered, quote, a successful model. And so it's so important to understand what are the consequences when the US does this kind of thing. And the consequences for Iran were that the Shah was reinstalled more brutal than before, crack down on any kind of dissent, and people who had been organizing against the Shah were either killed, imprisoned, sent into exile, tortured, and people had to organize in very clandestine kind of ways. And there was only one institution where people could physically meet to organize, and that was the mosques. And so while the opposition to the Shah was both secular and religious, 
In fact, Iran has a long, very beautiful history of leftist organizing, a socialist party, the Tudem party. Uh, when the Shah was finally overthrown in 1979, it was the clerics that had the upper hand, that had the ability to take power then. And many of the secular people were driven out, again, imprisoned, killed, uh, and the, uh, the Islamic Republic was formed. And it was not only an Islamic Republic that was against the Shah, it was also anti-US because of the history of the US meddling, and it was anti-Israel, and it was pro-Palestinian. And in the uh, aftermath of the US uh, of the Iranian uh, revolution, some of you might remember the taking over of the U.S. Embassy, where 52 Americans were held hostage for 444 days. And this was on the nightly news in the U.S. every single day. And it really has kind of formed the basis of a lot of the antagonism in the United States towards Iran, where the 1953 coup formed the basis of the antagonism the other way around. And um, the US cut off relations with Iran and imposed sanctions. And those sanctions have been in place in one form or another since 1959. And there have been periods of a little better relations, and I talk about them in the book during those years, but mostly antagonistic relations all of that time. And so I want to fast forward to the time of Barack Obama, when there was really an international effort to say, OK, we are going to come to grips with this issue of Iran's nuclear program. We're going to come to a deal on the nuclear program. And if we can come to that deal, this could become the basis for talking to Iran about other issues. And indeed, John Kerry, who was Secretary of State at the time, who worked really hard on this deal, said that he had hoped this deal would be the beginning of talking to Iran about issues of the conflicts in the Middle East in general, and all kinds of other things. So the deal was, was uh, signed in March of 2015, not just by Iran and the US, but also by France, Britain, and, um, and Germany, along with Russia and China. It was endorsed by the entire European Union, and it was endorsed unanimously by the UN Security Council. But there was one fatal flaw in the Iran peace deal. And it's not that it had a sunset clause after so many years. Uh, and it's not that it didn't deal with all these other issues like ballistic missiles and Iran's role in the region. The fatal flaw is that it was not a treaty. Because a treaty had to be endorsed by the Senate. And not just with a simple majority, but with a two-thirds majority. And the partisanship at that time, similar to the partisanship at this time, meant that Barack Obama did not feel he could get the votes to get the Senate to approve that. And so it was an executive order, not a peace treaty. And that then made it easy for Donald Trump, after saying the whole time on the campaign trail, we're still ever going to tear this thing up, indeed, when he came into office, um, tore it up. And so that's where we stand today. The Iran nuclear deal, it's important to understand. One, it was a good deal with compromises on, on all sides. Two, Iran was complying with the deal. And that was repeatedly confirmed by the International Atomic Energy Association that was tasked with monitoring uh, the internal workings in Iran with the most stringent monitoring system that has ever been devised. In fact, Donald Trump would really be doing great if he managed to get such an intensive monitoring with North Korea. And yet, Donald Trump did not listen to the other countries who want to stay with the deal, did not listen to the Iranian government who said it's important to keep this deal intact, didn't listen to the 
uh, monitors, and instead listened to Saudi Arabia that never wanted the deal uh, to be uh, implemented, and Israel. In fact, Israel was lobbying hard during the negotiations for John Kerry to scrap the deal and instead bomb. So let me ask you a question here. How many nuclear weapons does Iran have? So maybe we should all make the sign here, right? Zero, zero nuclear weapons. It's important to understand that. Iran has zero nuclear weapons. Let me ask you another question. How many nuclear weapons does Israel have? No one knows. And why doesn't anybody know? Because Israel has been lying about its nuclear program since the 1960s when it started that program. We think Israel might have about 200 nuclear weapons. But the truth is we don't know. They are secretive about it, they lie about it, they put people in prison who talk about it. They will not join the non-proliferation treaty with the, which the Iranians joined. They would not let one international inspector into Israel. Yet Bibi Netanyahu is the one who convinced Donald Trump that Iran could not be trusted. And, you know, as long as we're talking about irony, let's think about how many nuclear weapons the United States has and what it's like for some people in Iran to be subjected to that kind of intense pressure when there is such hypocrisy in the world about nuclear weapons. And I hope I agree with all of you here that we would like to see a nuclear weapons-free world. And certainly, if Donald Trump talked to Putin about a nuclear weapons free world. And we don't want Iran to get nuclear weapons. But you have to see it from the point of view of some of the people in Iran who think of it now as a nationalist kind of issue. Why is this being imposed on us? And you also have to understand that Iran is not monolithic. It is a very complex society where you have divisions within the clerics, where you have secular groups, where you have moderate factions and more conservative factions. And unlike Saudi Arabia, where there's no pretense to have elections at all, at least in Iran, there are presidential elections. And while the candidates are vetted, not anybody can run for office, there are still different factions, and it matters which factions win. And Rouhani, the president now, is considered among the more moderate, and he was the one who pushed for the negotiations, while others, the more conservatives, said, why are you bothering to talk to the United States and the West? You can't trust them. And lo and behold, they were right. We made a deal and then went back on the deal. And so the more conservatives are gaining more power now than they had before. And what is happening is that the US is trying to squeeze and squeeze the Iranian economy so that people will rise up and revolt against the government. This is not about nuclear weapons. This is about overthrowing the government in Iran. Now there are many people in Iran that don't like their government. And I dedicate several chapters to the book to lack of free speech, association, assembly, cracking down on certain minority groups, whether it's ethnic minorities or some of the religious minorities. But the question is, what would take its place? And that's where we really don't know. And Iranians that I talk to, and I know we have one Iranian here in the audience, any other Iranians here? Um, the ones who, who I talk to say whether they like the government or don't like the government are really worried about what would happen if this government fell. Who would take over? Well, one of the groups that the U.S. seems to be grooming is called the MEK. From everything that I hear, the MEK is hated in Iran. Why? 
because it's a group that did help overthrow the Shah, but then when, when they did not become part of the new power structure, and many of them were killed brutally by the regime that took over, they decided they were going to join the enemy, and the enemy at that time was Iraq. Saddam Hussein invaded Iran in 1980, a bloody eight-year war in which hundreds of thousands of people were killed. The MEK was trained and armed by the enemy, Saddam Hussein, to go back inside Iran and blow stuff up, including a lot of civilians who were killed. So it will never have legitimacy in Iran because of that. It's also considered a cult organization. It is manipulating our political operatives, both in the left, well, not the left, the liberal, like Howard Dean from the Democratic Party, or to the uh, conservatives, Newt Gingrich loves the MEK, uh, Rudy Giuliani loves the MEK, just spoke at their big uh, convention, uh, and John Bolton loves the MEK. John Bolton wrote an op-ed in 2015 in the New York Times that said to get rid of Iran's bombs, remember they have zero, bomb Iran. And he has said openly to the MEK, we will be with you back in Tehran in 2019. Now, the US is doing exactly what it did in Iraq, remember? in Iraq, set up a group out of a whole cloth uh, with Ahmed Chalabi, somebody who had not been living in Iraq, all these uh, diaspora Iraqis who had no base of support, and in the uh, hubris of our empire, thought we could go in and install these people, and things would just work fine. Obviously, that did not happen. Obviously, the U.S. cannot go in and install another government. It just is not going to work. It would be absolute chaos. But you know what? Some people think chaos is actually what some of the U.S. leaders want. And maybe that's what Israel wants. Because what would happen then? There are a lot of minority groups in Iran. Maybe they would all start vying for their own independent states. Maybe Iran as one entity would break up just as pretty much Iraq is today. And for Israel, it would be better to deal with a smaller countries than one big 80 million people country. In the meantime, the US squeezing Iran is hurting ordinary people. You know, it doesn't hurt the government. Sanctions don't hurt the government. They don't hurt the people at the top. They hurt the ordinary people. And so with the tremendous pressure that is on now with the reimposition of sanctions, the US is not just saying our companies can't trade with Iran. They're saying nobody should trade with Iran. And certainly not anybody that has anything, any business to do either in the United States or with US dollars, which is the international currency. And so European countries that after the nuclear deal was signed in 2015 started either trade with Iran or making deals with Iran for large amounts of money, automobile companies, Airbus, even in the US, Boeing, to sell civilian aircraft to try to update the very old and dangerous aircraft inside Iran, they're now tearing up those, uh, those uh, agreements because they know the US is gonna go after them. And Iranians are not seeing the benefits that they were led to believe they would get if they signed the nuclear deal. So it's a very dangerous situation now. The value of the currency, the real, is about half what it was eight months ago. The prices have doubled. People are complaining. There are demonstrations in the streets. Uh, and again, this is part of what our policy is aimed to do. So where do we go from here? I think, um, I just saw a, a, an op-ed today that uh, Senator Tim Kaine wrote. Tim Kaine is no leftist. Tim Kaine, I don't know if he'd even call him a liberal. He's kind of a middle-of-the-road Democrat. 
And he wrote a piece today basically saying, the Trump administration is taking us down the path to war with Iran. It is extremely dangerous. Let's look at what happened when we did that in Iraq. Let's not go there. There are very few people in Congress who are saying anything about it. In fact, we just met with somebody in, uh, in Congress who said they couldn't even get past an amendment that asked the State Department to study the effects of sanctions on the Iranian people. They didn't even want to pass that. What they talk about and they pass are anti-Iran, anti-Iran, anti-Iran constantly. Iran is the biggest threat in the Middle East. Iran is meddling in the Middle East. You know, we ought to laugh a little bit about that one. Meddling in the Middle East. Iran is in the Middle East. The U.S. is meddling in the Middle East and has been meddling there for far too long. We could talk about and might not like some of the things that Iran is doing in the Middle East. Surely they are uh, supporting the, the Assad regime in Syria. They have Shia militias that they have helped to form in Iraq that have been accused of some really bad human rights abuses against some of the Sunni populations. Um, but Iran is part of the region and has to be brought into negotiations because there will never be peace either in Syria, in Iraq, or anywhere, unless Iran is part of that process. And let's face it, Iran is not just sitting around waiting for the US to bomb them. Iran is planning all kinds of things they can do to harm US interests in the region, to harm American soldiers and the bases that are surrounding Iran, to harm US allies, whether it's in Saudi Arabia or in Israel, and it would be truly catastrophic. In fact, maybe our best allies in terms of the US government right now is Jim Mattis, the Secretary of Defense in the Pentagon. Because even though he is very anti-Iran, he is considered a hawk on Iran, he understands how horrendous a war with Iran would be. So let me just sum up here saying, we need to find ways to push, in fact, we're meeting with Tim Kaine as soon as they get back to Washington, to push people in Congress to say, we refuse to go to another war in the Middle East. We need to start creating more daylight between the US and Saudi Arabia, and we've been making progress on that by having votes, for example, in the Senate to stop weapon sales to Saudi Arabia, where we got 44 senators to agree we have to get to 51. And of course, we have to do more to create more daylight between the US and Israel, given that Israel not only is oppressing the Palestinians inside Israel, but Israel is egging the US on to go to war with Iran and might take the moves themselves first to start bombing Iran's non-existent nuclear weapons uh, as a way to drag the US into a war. So I want to end by quoting somebody who is no longer with us, but I think represents the kind of uh, sharing of the beauty of other people's cultures um, that we want to see more of. And that is Anthony Bourdain. Somebody sent me this incredible quote from Anthony Bourdain. And um, let me just read it to you. He said, Iran was mind blowing. My crew has never been treated so well by total strangers everywhere. We had heard that Persians were nice, but the nicest, we didn't see that coming. You should watch Anthony Bourdain's piece on Iran. Absolutely beautiful. Uh, and the other quote I want to end with is Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labor Party, in his speech today before the throngs out in London. And when I heard it, it just gave me chills. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if the leaders of the Democratic Party <laughs> would stand before the hundreds of thousands of people out on the street and say these kinds of words. And Jeremy Corbyn said, 
We are asserting our right to a world that is not divided by misogyny, racism, and hate. We wish to live in a world of peace, not at war. We wish not to blame the refugees for the wars that they have themselves have been victims of. And we wish to pursue the politics of unity, the politics of togetherness, the politics of recognizing the strengths and the good that is in each of us, no matter how poor or marginalized. Rather than politics of fear and austerity, we want human rights for the rest of the world. We want justice for the rest of the world. But above all, the message we give here today in all of our diversity is one of solidarity of people wanting a different and better world. When we divide ourselves by xenophobia and hatred, at the end of the day, we all lose. When we unite together with common objectives, we all can win. Thank you. So we have time for discussion. I'm going to pass around a, a sign-up sheet. Uh, and unlike um, the promises that the Peace Library made, uh, it's not once a month, but the most we would send you is once a week. But they will be important. So please, uh, if you don't mind signing in. And I think we have time for some discussion. And then we'll be selling books in the back there. Um, the books, by the way, I, um, we lose money when we write books. Uh, we do not make money on them, especially because we sell them at cost be at, between a sliding scale of 10 to $20. But the purpose is to get them out there, give them to your friends, give them to schools, other libraries. So if you're interested, please get a book in the back and I'd be happy to sign them. And now we can start our discussion. Do we have another mic? Yes. Right here. So you want to call on people? Well, you get to call on people. Ah, okay. So let's see. Yeah. <coughs> you should be trying to talk. Who would make a good president? Who could do things right? I would say Bernie Sanders would be a great place to start. Um, he has not been the greatest on foreign policy issues. In fact, the best foreign policy speech he gave was after his campaign. Um, but he has been getting better, and uh, he's just fantastic on the issues of the economy, and uh, on so many issues that are so important. Um, he's really incorporated the issue around uh, racism and mass incarceration. Uh, he is fantastic on issues around the environment. You know, we have a number of people, you know, we, we're not gonna get, um, unfortunately, with a, uh, a two-party system that tries to keep other parties like the Green Party from being able to fully participate as they are able to participate in other countries, um, we have to make real compromises. Uh, but I do think that we could have some good candidates coming up. And people like Elizabeth Warren um, is a, uh, you know, somebody that I think a lot of us would love to see. Um, there are other people like Kamala Harris from California so um, I think that we could do a, uh, get some, some more progressive folks in the Democratic Party to get the ticket. Oh. Hi, Dan. Thanks for your talk and your books. Um, well, you mentioned that it's illegal for uh, Americans to travel to Iran. No, uh, North Korea. Uh, North Korea, I'm sorry. The other thing it's illegal to do is to own a copy of the books that have been made from the um, shredded documents that were recovered from the U.S. Embassy during the takeover. And for years and years and years, the Iranians have been putting together these cross-hashed um, shredded papers and publishing thousands of these documents every year. 
It's illegal for a U.S. citizen to own the book. We can read it. It's available in Canada. Um, but that's how long going and how biased against uh, the Iranians that our laws are. And I'm sure that uh, in the same way that the WikiLeaks documents showed how corrupt our government was, even towards Germany, to consider what it did with Iran when they had the Shah and running all that, this got to be just uh, shocking. So um, thank you for your book, and thank you for getting information about our country's horrible treatment of Iran. Well, thank you for that information, and I'm going to the uh, World Without War conference in Canada in September, and I will look for that book and bring it back. <laughs> Thank you again. I refer to my comrade just to the right of me. Hamid was five years old when the when Mosaddegh was overthrown. So he was this is Hamid right here. Yeah. yeah. Hamid was inadequate. Inadequate. Sorry, I'm in trouble. Wasn't fully politically conscious at the time. I have to tell you. <laughs> but uh, my other comrade Mustafa, who was 87 couldn't make it tonight, he was uh, exhausted, was very active in the Tudor party uh, and uh, was handing out literature and was arrested by a sheriff who uh, subjected him to fake torture. The sheriff was, in fact, a member of the Tudor party who that's the socialist party for him. strung him up by his hands, but his feet were on the ground, so that's how that worked. I mentioned that because Tudor party was very much within the structure of the Mosaday regime, if you will. And uh, under the Shah's regime of torture, 500 military professional people who were two department members were arrested and tortured to death. Uh, and later, as you know, Khomeini was given a list of several hundred two department members and tortured them to death. These are pretty extreme methods of torture, too, by the way. Uh, so there was a moment of complicity between the U.S., CIA, and the Islamic regime. And now I get to kind of a, a question, a little bit of a challenge. Are we swinging a bit of a kind of a two-bladed sword at Iran in that we have reason to unite with uh, Saudi Arabia and Israel, etc., but at the same time, by threatening them, we strengthen the hand of the Islamic regime from the standpoint of fostering you know, nationalism and national unity. I know that doesn't reach the conscious element, but maybe the masses are held in check by our threats, and maybe that's part of our intent. Maybe you'll comment. So you're saying the U.S. really wants to keep the regime in place? The forces which might eventually overthrow the regime, uh -huh. it's really, in my view, is really not the MEK, but actually the remnants of Tudor Party and the other socialist elements. Or the Revolutionary Guard. Well, the Revolutionary Guard is defending the uh, Islamic regime. Right. Right. Okay, it's just uh, something So, so the, 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 the uh, we don't know. You know, when Jimmy Carter went to um, Iran in, uh, in 1978, he said Iran was the most stable country in the Middle East and six months later the Shah fell. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen and Iranians I talk to all have different scenarios of what they think might happen. The thing that they have in common is they don't see any good scenario. So it seems to be uh, unified in we should change the government from within we have seen not only what happened in Iraq, but we see Libya, and we see Syria, and um, they can't find any good example of where the U.S. has helped usher in a more democratic system. So I don't know, but how many wants to come? Yeah, I think if you could use this. Couple comments. If you could keep it close to you. So I have just put on my. Uh, uh, pieces and I look the comfortable, uh, not comfortable, but anyway, the few points that you made in terms of uh, uh, 
Brazil the problem in the Middle East. Uh, 19, I guess, 72 or 78, one of the poorest uh, general uh, United States that was uh, uh, Paul, uh, the Republican uh, vice president became a uh, tall man. His name is uh, Aramay. He was his secretary. He was vice president of Bush. That when and uh, you guys know him. What's his name? Yes. Hot, um, the Afro American from a uh, Jamaican background. Jamie. Jamie. Oh. Well, yeah. Paul. 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 Said that uh, one of his deputies brought a piece of paper and showed it to him. Do you know about this paper? What is the paper? We are going to attack uh, uh, Iraq. Why are we going to? And he's a forest uh, general. He asked him, Why are we going <laughs> to uh, attack Iraq? Uh, he says, uh, I guess they don't have anything to do. And, they are going to go and get busy killing some. Anyway, it happened two months later. I just paraphrase his, uh, what he said. Uh, same guy came and said, passed by the forest of general. Uh, and he asked what's happened. Uh, things are going. He said, well, things got worse than what you are saying. They have planned to invade seven countries. Starting from Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, going to Libya, Iraq, Lebanon, Sudan, Somalia, and Iran would be the last. Wesley so they Clark. have achieved the rest of the world. This really, Wesley you Clark. Destroy the Wesley Clark. Wesley Clark, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and uh, that is what, why they are pro Israel. Assad, because they are afraid they are going to be the next invading yes. uh, All of the above, the Libya was, I don't know if you can call even Hillary Clinton a human being, being there, the stating things at the time that the massacre, what's, your, uh, what's his name? Uh, so I, I understand what you're saying, and, and totally, this has been, there's a, a long plan to um, overthrow the Iranian government, and uh, there is a pattern, and the Iranians are very aware of that. The Iranian government is very aware of that. Um, there's also this group called the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies that you might have heard of, extremely powerful with this administration. And they have been saying for a long time that the U.S. should overthrow the government of Iran. And just last week when I was in the Congress, I was wearing this shirt that says Peace with Iran. And a group called me over and they said, what do you mean Peace with Iran? And uh, I said, well, you know, we'd like Peace with Iran. Well, it turned out they went around the table and they were all from different minority groups. Uh, they were... Uh, Arab Iranians, they were Azeris, they were Balochis, they were all different. And they were all here on U.S. government money to lobby the U.S. government money, uh, uh, lobby the U.S. Congress against the Iranian government. And so we have been putting our tax dollars, our government has been putting a lot of our tax dollars over the years in trying to foment dissent, not only in general among the population, uh, but also among these minority groups. So yes, you're absolutely right. This is not, unfortunately, nothing new. What they feel now is we're very close. And now with the economic situation, they can just do one more push, get over the edge, and this government will crumble. Yes. Over here.
<laughs> okay, I'll try this. Um, since you have experience with people in Congress, do you have any insight into why they think that things are going to turn out differently the next time? <laughs> because <laughs> things have not turned out well in any of these examples. Well, it's an absolutely perfectly rational question that you ask, but that's unfortunately not the way our system works. And our system works on each individual caring about themselves, pretty much. And will they be reelected? and will they have money? And if they're in a safe district, they are then asked to have money to support other districts. And it's a really, really corrupt system we have. You might have heard of APAC, the very strong pro-Israel foreign policy lobby group. They are extremely influential in Congress and in every single congressional district. It's not just money. They have people power. They organize very well. They threaten Congress people if they don't vote the right way. Nobody really, except Tim Kaine, I said, is a very rare thing. Congress people do not want to come out and show any kind of sympathy towards the Iranian government uh, much, the, uh, and, and maybe they will do something like question, does this make sense? But they're worried that that will be seen as being sympathetic towards the Iranian government. So it doesn't make any sense, it's not logical, unless you think what they really want is chaos. And you know, chaos does sell weapons. The CEO of Boeing was asked when the U.S. reimposed sanctions just recently, they said, you're, uh, they were asked in the media, you're going to lose a $20 billion deal that you were making with Iran to sell civilian aircraft. Aren't you upset about this? And the CEO basically said, well, yeah, that's a shame, but we'll make even more money with continued chaos, the continued conflict in the region. Creative chaos, Condoleezza Rice. Yes, I'm back there. I just wanted to mention a couple of resources. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Oh. Well, we have something here. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, you mentioned Elizabeth Warren and somebody else who I consider progressive. How do you feel about the fact that we're getting more uh, progressives on in the public office, which I think is a direct result of Bernie Sanders? I think it's absolutely thrilling. Oh, uh, I mean, I vote for Jill Stein and the Green Party. Um, I, so. I am really glad to see more progressives in whatever party they're in to get elected. Yeah. And I think, Regardless. yes, and uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Tis, the young woman from uh, the Bronx that got uh, just got the, on, the yes. nomination and will probably be in Congress is absolutely thrilling, just like um, Pramila Jayapal from Seattle is a real activist who's in there and was with us getting arrested in the Congress over the immigration issue two weeks ago, just like um, a somebody we thought was going to be quite conservative, Ro Khanna from Silicon Valley, came in and is one of the best champions on foreign policy issues that we have right now. So there are some good ones and we need more of them. Exactly. I just wanted to mention a couple of resources uh, if you're interested in Iran. One of them, I don't know how you feel about them, but uh, NIAC, the National Iranian American Council, they're not a lefty organization, they're, but they're very interested in uh, a sane policy towards Iran. Uh, they get attacked from all sides, so they're probably doing something right. Uh, uh, but it's, it's NIAC, and they, they send out, you won't get bombarded with emails, but they do send out alerts when there's something going on where public input would be valuable. The other thing I was going to mention is that I'm organizing a tour to Iran uh, this fall. I think my group is probably full at this point, but I just wanted to plant the idea with everybody here. It's legal, it's amazingly cheap, the Iranians are everything that uh, Anthony Bourdain says they are. In fact, if you watch his video about Iran, which you can find on Netflix, you will want to go. And I, I've been tw twice in 2016, 2017. I really think that kind of people-to-people -people diplomacy, I mean, is can make a difference. And so I would urge you to consider your next vacation in Iran. Uh, it's it's also very safe, contrary to the popular impression. N-I-A-C, if you 
Google NIAC, I'm sure they'll come up near the He's top. He's the National Iranian American Council. And what is your group called? Uh, well, my name's Jeremy Iggers. Um, I'm, it, track me down one way or the other and I can tell you more. As I say, I think my group is probably full for this fall. I may try to do it again next year. But you could even do it on your own. There are a couple of excellent travel agencies based. Well, you can do it with somebody like the Road Scholar, and it's $7,000 plus airfare. Or you can do it through an Iranian travel agency in Shiraz who will help you get the visa. And then it's like, depending on the level of comfort you want, somewhere between one and 2,000 plus airfare. So, uh, but if you want help or advice or suggestions, contact me, and I can at least steer you towards resources. <coughs> Wonderful, that is fabulous, and um, I would totally agree that going to Iran is uh, eye-opening, wonderful. I'm part of a, another organization that I help co-found called Global Exchange, and they have trips to Iran. They have one coming up in October that does have space on it, and it's globalexchange.org. I was just trying to find a, um, a poster that NIAC had that I absolutely love, and it was the day the Supreme Court came down and said that um, the Muslim ban was legal. And, um, you know, Iran is part of that Muslim ban, even though Iran, Iranians have never been involved in any terrorist activities in the United States. And uh, it was a beautiful Nayak poster that said, um, we are engineers, architects, artists, um, poets, um, Muslim, Jewish, atheist, uh, straight, bisexual, whatever, we are not terrorists. And they're doing, they're having to put a lot of their energy now working on this Muslim ban because so many of the people in the Iranian American community now can't see their, rel can't bring their relatives here. Uh, students are afraid of going back home. Will they be able to come back in again? Uh, and it is really causing a lot of chaos in the lives of many thousands of people. So, but thank you for taking people to your own. So, why don't you just pick folks? Yeah. Good to you. It's, it's always a pleasure to see you and hear you, and, and I look forward to reading your new book. Uh, I want to ask if, if you know or if you read uh, Garth Porter's book. Uh, he wrote a book about the. the uh, Exaggerations of the threat regarding the brand new nuclear program. Maybe. I, I. Yes, I read his book. It's wonderful. Uh, Gareth and I were in Iran together, and uh, I think he's done a lot of great work to try to um, support the Iran nuclear deal and uh, to try to stop us from going down this path of war. And would highly recommend his book. I think we have time for maybe, let me see how many more hands we have. So let's go for the one whose hands are up. One, two. And yeah, great. So one of the things about progressives running for office, um, I read a, a blog called um, Naked Capitalism. And one of the things I talk about in there is it's Progressives generally don't run on a peace platform, okay? In particular, you know, like you said, Bernie Sanders' foreign policy is not very well spelled out. Um, and one of the reasons that they talk about this is it's sort of strategic, maybe by some, maybe not by everybody, but because every member of Congress, you know, when they, did, when they do allocations for armaments, manufacturing, they put a plant in every district, right? And, you know, the military industrial complex is very, very strong, right? And then I'm just looking for what you think is a strategy. I mean, it's a, it's a lot to ask for. You know, what is a strategy to, to go after the military industrial complex and try to go for a peace platform long term without getting, you know, if they, if they realize that we're actually a threat, like we're not just going for Medicare for all, right? Then they, it could get nasty, right? And that, that's a issue. So I'm just looking for- No, you fabulous, and I'm so glad you brought it up because I get to talk about a program of ours that I'm really excited about, uh, and it's called Divest from the War Machine. 
you're you're absolutely right. You know that Bernie Sanders took three hundred and fifty-five thousand dollars from the weapons industry. Um, so he is just an example of the kinds of money that. Uh, he has right down in his district. He supported the F-35 coming into Burlington. Um, and uh, it becomes an issue about jobs, jobs, jobs in the district. And so we started, we as Code Pink with many other organizations, started a new campaign called Divest from the War Machine. Just like the wonderful campaigns around fossil fuels, divesting from fossil fuels, and you might have seen the Irish government just divested from fossil fuels. Um, the, uh, we have to do the same thing. So it's going to pension funds, universities, cities, uh, individuals, and to politicians. And we have a fabulous new tool to see if your university or other institution, your church, is invested in war, uh, industry because they'll basically say to you we don't know well now we have a tool and it's called the weapons free fund and you can go online and it's hundreds of these different funds and it's rated about whether they are invested in weapons companies and the other thing that we have done these are hundreds of weapons companies that are that are um, looked in, into to create this weapons free fund but in terms of politicians we wanted to simplify it and so we made it just the NRA and the five top weapons companies. So Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, General Dynamics, and Raytheon. And we've gone to these politicians and say, will you agree not to take money from these, uh, the lobby group in these companies? And we just started this recently. We're actually having a good response. Uh, some of them don't take money already and some of them take small amounts of money and some of them don't even know if they're taking money or not. Sure. So um, it's a great campaign. I know you have, uh, uh, Keith Ellison said to us right away, he would agree, of course now he's trying to get another position, uh, but whoever takes his spot. Uh, and uh, Betty McCollum has not agreed to join us yet, so it would be great to have some pressure on her to uh, agree to not take the money. But thank you for that. So I think we have one more person. Yeah. Uh, so I, I gather that you think that uh, the war danger vis-a-vis -vis Iran is fairly prominent at this point. Um, but I, from what I read, is Iran is very strong as a state. There may be some disturbances in there, but it's not like I don't. I, I don't gather that the United States government has been able to penetrate like they have in, say, Venezuela or Syria or something like that. And that's the way that they get these things going on. Or do you know something that we don't know? Well, look at the um, how radical this sanctions regime is. So I mentioned it's about not letting other companies and other countries deal with Iran. Now the US is going after the oil. And they want other countries not to buy Iranian oil. You know the country that is most benefiting from these sanctions? China. China is Iran's number one trading partner. And the US is going to other major buyers of uh, Iranian oil. And that includes India, South Korea, Turkey, and saying to them, don't buy Iranian oil. So that means more and more will be just to China, because China cushions its own companies against US financial sanctions. But one, it's on very uh, negative terms for the Iranians, because they have, there's, China doesn't have competition then. And uh, two, uh, they can't get the kind of improvements that they need to have more output for their oil. And um, the, uh, the, it, it's starting to really bite. It's hurting Iranians. They have not felt this level of pressure from the sanctions ever. So that is something that is new in this equation. Um, 
And then in terms of other ways that a war could start, it could start in Syria, egged on by the Israelis who have already bombed Iranians inside Syria. Uh, it could start in, uh, already they position Yemen as if it's a proxy war, which it did not start out to be at all. Uh, but there are many w places in these hot spots that things could get even worse than they are now. And that could lead to the Israelis getting involved and bombing inside Iran. And that's why I think it is so incredibly dangerous. And in fact, the US and Israel have a working group, and it's said that the Saudis are part of this, about how to not only continue to tighten the screws on the Iranian uh, economy, but also how to best support the dissident groups inside Iran right now, including the different minority groups. The entire stage is being set for upheaval inside Iran. And so I, I think we better get serious about this and understand it is pretty much a repeat of the Iraqi sanctions, the Iraqi situation in general. And you know, it's one thing to have stupid, crass, horrific people in our government. And it's another thing for us, the American people, to just sit by and watch it happen. So I think on this, we uh, I see some more hands, very one little tiny thing right here. <laughs> and then we will, we will wrap up. Because I do want to sign books for you all. Well, I imagine I'm not very much different from anybody else on this planet in that I wish that we would all figure out how to make the war machinery all be required to have peace conversion plans. How can we do that? Well, I think first we have to answer, but I just want everybody to think about We really, we could do that. I know we could. Well, we did it big time after World War II. And we did it even in the 80s, there was a big conversion plan. So we certainly know how to do it. And we certainly know all the things that we are lacking in terms of infrastructure that could, that we need highly skilled people to do. I live in Washington, D.C., in the nation's capital. You know what we were told today? Don't drink the water. Don't drink the tap water. Alerts going out in the nation's capital of the most powerful nation on the earth. Don't drink the water because the tube broke and the water was contaminated. So that's just one example of the idiocy of how we are spending our money and how we're using the resources of our people, including the brains of our chemists, our engineers, the people who we need to take us into an economy that is not based on fossil fuels. So thank you all for the work that you're doing here to make this area of the country a little more progressive and for the work you're doing and especially um, Women Against Military Madness is such a wonderful example for so many years. Thank you. Make its way to the back, that would be great. And